Hi, and welcome to Loremaker's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm your host for today, senior writer Will Weisbaum. Thank you for joining us. For those of you who are new to the program, Loremaker's Guide is where we folks on the narrative team get a chance to walk you through some of the interesting sites and systems to be found in Star Citizen's vast universe. So today we're going to be taking a look at Gleis or Gleis or Gleis, depending on how you'd like to pronounce it. There's a lot of debate on that. Um, and it is a Banu system, so that should be fun. The Banu is definitely in my top six alien races to be found in Star Citizen. Um, <laughs> got, got a laugh out of Jared. Uh, so we're starting, we're floating here on Earth, so let's use our handy dandy star map to head on over. Oh, let's do a route. I'm not searching for it. I'm going to do a route. We're going to go from Earth and we're going to head to Greece. Uh, let's see, we want the main one. Greece. Let's say today I'm going to be flying there in my, let's see, which ship? I should probably go there in like a Banu Merchantman. That only seems appropriate. I bought the thing, might as well use it, right? So we're going to head over there in our Merchantman. So let's calculate that route. Let's see, we have two options going through Davian. One's 12 jumps and one's nine jumps. Uh, I'm going to save you a couple clicks from having to watch me do this. So let's go nine. Let's view that route. All right, we're starting off on, that's not Earth, but it's still fine. And we're going to go through over to Killian. And now we're in Ellis. I'm going to jump over to Nexus. There, Hades. Oh man, we're seeing a wide swath trying to head over to Gleese from Nemo to Coral and now we're going from there into Giddon and then our last jump we go through uh, uh, yeah. very exciting welcome to Gleese and you can see right off the bat that it is a main sequence type A star and it's blue white so you can see we got that cool blue white render going there congratulations to Turbulent for allowing us to do that it's really snazzy. This is a six planet system. We'll zoom out and give a wide overview there. And it has three asteroid belts, so there's a lot of resources going on. Um, or two belts in a, in a cluster over there. Um, and the system is really a center point for a lot of Banu trading, which shouldn't be a huge surprise knowing what we do about Banu and how much they love to trade, but with as many resources as there has been present in the system, it has really become a hub of activity. Um, now, even though humanity first had contact with the Banu in 2438, we didn't get a chance to officially visit Gleese until way later in 2712, and the reason for that was that um, it took a long time to be able to negotiate the proper trade deals with the Banu uh, in order to get official access to it. Now, official access means like humanity as a whole was given permission and NAB access to the system. That's not to say no humans had ever visited the system before then. I'm sure there were some people who were forced to visit aboard indentured servant ships and stuff like that. But as a whole, of being able to get there regularly and easily, it didn't happen until the negotiations went through. Um, now, the reason why it took such a long time is because just how complicated it is to negotiate with Banu as a people, to do large-scale negotiations. For the Banu, their, their entire society is kind of made up through this guild system where they have these suli, to use their term for it, that kind of run everything. So you have your smaller sulis, which is like a shop on a street corner is run by a suli who does that, and then you have your manufacturing guilds, you have uh, all sorts of other guilds, but you also have political guilds that all the representative Sulis on a world or in a city will pay money towards the political guilds to kind of organize things because bureaucracy is a business just like anything else for the Banhu and the Sulis can be shifting, so that makes it very hard to negotiate anything on a grand scale when you have all these different separate interests that you have to get on board. So you have your local city Sulis and your planetary city Sulis, as well as your major trade representatives, and even down to navigational 
guilds who produced the nav drives and who had a vested stake in making sure that their proprietary map information didn't give out. So like we're kind of thinking for the, the Banu that their, their nav drives are kind of closely guarded and built separately by guilds. So they're hard coded in with the map data. So when you get your ship and you install the nav drive, that nav drive is, is only associated with that one ship. You're not supposed to be able to pull it off and install it somewhere else. You also can't pull off the nav information from there um, because it's hard coded in. And like different nav sulis offer different maps. Like some may have some jump tunnels and shorter navigations than another nav drive manufacturer. And the information eventually gets disseminated out to different people as the guilds dissolve and reform new ones and workers go from one place to the next, bringing information with them. But basically all of this complication made it very hard for the initial UNE delegates to form trade deals and get humanity access. And you might be saying, well, don't the Banu love trading? And, and you're right, so good job on saying that. But what it is is that that they're not the only guild involved. So there would be, you know, the mining guilds and other local guilds wouldn't want this huge influx of humans coming and ruining their trade. So they were very hesitant and resistant to that influx. Like the, the mining guilds put up a strong front to a lot of worlds from being allowed people to come in. Um, and you know that wasn't true for all systems. It was different for every system. So over the course uh, of the years, the UNE was able to initially negotiate terms for Bacchus, Geddon, and Kins. And so humanity started going with there, um, which is impressive in itself. And actually, one of, early on in one of the negotiating sessions, um, humanity didn't. The UNE representatives didn't quite do it right. So traders almost got. Uh, attacked by a mercenary guild for violating trade rights and they're like we just negotiated this We're, we have a right to be here and then they found out that the Suli that they had negotiated with had dissolved and so completely changed their way of thinking about contracts and can you imagine like being in the middle of a negotiation that's been going on for weeks only to find that the party that you've been negotiating with is no longer existent and so you have to start over with a new group it was a long process, so it was impressive that we got as far as we did. Um, but it kind of dried up after a certain point because while the Banu were the first aliens that we had contact with, when we started running into the Tavar and, and the Xi'an, things weren't as warm and fuzzy. We had a very long-standing cold war with the Xi'an, and the Tavar and we had some very hot wars. So all of a sudden, humanity's trust of aliens waned and there was no longer such a big push to open up trade and to have interspecies deals going on. Um, and, and so basically no new systems were added for a while, especially with the Messer regime was really, you know, driven by this kind of xenophobia as part of their mainstay. Um, but eventually, come early 28th century, uh, Vanduul had just started attacking us. Military spending was at an all-time high. Taxation was at an all-time high to pay for all this stuff. Humanity was spread out after rapid development. Messers had spent a lot of money trying to build up worlds, and the whole human economy was starting to kind of collapse in itself. It couldn't support this. And tried a lot of things to get it going again. And so Imperator Messer the Eighth, Samuel Messer, decided that one way to do it would be to push forward with opening up new trade routes with the Banu. So for the first time in like two centuries, he sent a delegate to renegotiate for access. And so the main focus was on getting access to Gleese because they knew about Gleese and they knew that it was this great trading hub. So they thought it would be a real boon to the human economy if we could get access to it. And so sure enough, uh, we were able to do it. And a lot of economists think that uh, getting this trade access has kept the Messer regime live for an additional decades past what they would have otherwise if the economy had collapsed. Um, so here's the system overall. It's pretty great. And we're going to zoom in and start on our first planet, which is Gleese 1. Now, Gleese 1 is an iron planet. And you might be asking, does it have a metal core? The answer is yes, it is metal to its very core. 
Uh, it is composed mostly of superheated ferromagnetic iron. Uh, it's a relatively sleep area. There isn't much traffic here. There has been a recent uptick of humans coming to visit Gliese 1 because of its strong magnetics, where they go in orbit. And apparently, it said there's been a problem with some cybernetic limbs. Sometimes when they attach, there is nerve pain and other stuff that develops over time. So to help ease symptoms associated with having these cybernetic limbs, people say that orbiting around Gliese 1 can help alleviate that because of its uh, unique magnetic signature. Of course, there has yet to be medical evidence that this is true, but a lot of people believe it. Uh, over here we have Gliese 2. Let me, there we go. Look at that, look at that little guy. Uh, it has a, I'm gonna throw out some numbers here because we have all these stats and I don't wanna get into all of them, but just for fun, just so you know, Gliese 2 has a semi-major axis of 1.211 AU. Uh, with an epihelion of 1.29 and a perihelion of 1.13. So enjoy those numbers. Um, it is a terrestrial rocky smog world, and you might be asking, does it have rings? And the answer is yes, it does have rings. Uh, what makes Gliese 2 so unique in the system is that it actually has a retrograde rotation, which means that the smog planet is spinning in the opposite direction of all the rest of the planets in the system. Uh, and if you've ever seen a Superman movie, you know that means time is also moving backwards. I'm just kidding, time moves regularly. Uh, from there, we're gonna head out to Gliese Belt Alpha. Uh, now, now, not a lot of systems have multiple asteroid belts, but you might notice the naming system that, we, uh, that the humans use for asteroid belts is that they use um, Roman letter names to designate them. So the first belt is alpha, the next one would be beta, and so forth. Now, uh, the alpha belt is an active mining zone, and active, in this case, means actually pretty violent. Uh, Banu aren't prone to violence traditionally when they can use negotiations to settle it, but because, as we'll find out in a second, the beta belt has been mostly mined out that there's a lot of active resources in the more difficult to get to uh, alpha belt, which has caused increased competition. So it's come down to the point where the ore value here is so high that it is worth kind of inciting violence and fighting each other where it normally wouldn't be worth the risk of destroying ships and that stuff. So there's actually a little bit of a trade war going on in the belt now. Um, Eventually, the cost analysis will turn the other way and the violence should hopefully peter out, but we'll see. Um, and how Banu fight is that the old contract with like often mercenary guilds and hire them to fight their fights for them while they stay in the background. So, uh, Next up, we're gonna go to Gliese 3. Uh, so, Gliese 3. Where are you at? There you are. So Gliese 3 is a terrestrial. <laughs> Let's try this again. Gliese 3 is a terrestrial rocky planet. Uh, it does not have an atmosphere. And this is actually more typical of how you'll find Banu mining operations. The surface of the world is dotted with, dotted with different mining outposts and refineries, and they close, they reopen, they shift control, and so it's constantly kind of in flux, but it's settled mostly through negotiation and rights deals, and like a Suli will dissolve, and two new Sulis will form up and split the former thing, and then, or a Suli will dissolve, and a new Suli will come in and claim their rights. So it's always in flux about who owns what, and so you can get in often on mining claims by waiting for stuff to open up through Suli's dissolving or trade deals being in flux, which is kind of cool. Um, from there, we have our next planet in the world, which is no-go, Gliese 4. And we're gonna circle back around to talk more about that, but it is a mysterious forbidden planet. And next to it is the Lyris Flotilla. As we keep moving out in the system, we have our next major belt, which is uh, the Beta. And this one has been mostly mined out. There isn't a lot of resources left. 
but there are a lot of salvageable resources instead of ore resources because of so much mining has been done there and oftentimes when an asteroid's depleted or whatever it's easier just to leave the equipment so there's a lot of salvagers working to collect the old mining equipment and there's wealth to be found there in that way um, from there we go to Gleese 5 which is a gas giant um, it has thick clouds of dense water vapor covering the surface um, and there's condensers usually at work here collecting that water. Um, some human corporations have come here uh, to make bottled water for human taste which has met with some controversy because there's claims that they might be using indentured servants to work which is kind of frowned upon but it's one of those winks that goes on among human corporations about why making products in Banu space is cheaper. Uh, you just get hit with uh, PR problems. Um, from there, we're going to go out to the Gamma Cluster, which is over here, which uh, it's not represented well here, but a cluster is not a full belt. It's just a partial ring, so it doesn't go all the way around the orbital plane. Um, this uh, distant and sparse cluster uh, has a dangerous represent. Rep reputation. It's got a dangerous reputation. Uh, and so only really experienced miners will head out there. Uh, dangerous not from attacks or anything, but dangerous just from the mining conditions. Like a lot of explosive gas pockets, a lot of rocks slamming into each other. So, And it's also really far away from the normal trade lane, so if you do get into trouble, uh, you might be stuck out there for a fair bit. The final planet in the system is Glee 6. Uh, it's a distant protoplanet. And it's kind of become tradition uh, for uh, new Sulis to come and leave a luck offering out on this distant world. Um, religion, just like everything else, is run by a different religious guilds who claim to, you know, pray on your behalf and buy favor on your behalf. So there's a, a couple of those operating out here in this distant remoteness. Um, so if you want good luck, you can come to them and offer them you know, and uh, a little bit of credits or some other resources and they will pray for luck on your behalf. So let's go back now to kind of the, uh, the focal point of the system, which is over here near Nogo, because we have the main trade hub, which is Lyris Flotilla, as well as this planet. Now, it's called Nogo because when humans first arrived in the system, they found this beautifully terraformed world, green, grassy plains, rolling hills, lovely, but there was no one living on it. Not a single Banu had settled on the world. It was this big point of confusion. And if you look in the old forests and old growths, you would find ruins of ancient settlements. And Banu, when you ask them, like, why aren't you on this world? They would just say, like, oh, you, you're not supposed to go there. Don't go there, which is how it eventually got its human nickname of no-go. Um, and the thing with Banu and the way that they treat history, it's the result that's important, not the cause. So the fact that gets passed on generation to generation is don't go to Gleese 4. The why is less important to them, so that's kind of been lost over time. And human settlements have come to claim parts of this planet for themselves and has succeeded thus far after you know all the initial tests didn't find anything harmful. So it's kind of like, well, if they're not going to use it, we might as well. And so, like, big human settlements have started to grow, and because of its proximity to all these natural resources and Lyris overhead, which is a natural trading hub, so they've been growing vegetables and sending up to the flotilla, and meanwhile, a bunch of building resources are coming down, so they're actually growing really fast. Kind of a, one problem that they're running into, though, is because there is no authority on this world. There's no government. The Banu don't police it. Humans don't police it. So there's also been outlaw settlements or kind of weird factions that have used this to claim a stake of their own. Um, and so it was very popular with outlaw, but now thanks to a Freedom of Information Act we found out that humans have struck out there. The Navy did uh, an operation there to strike at a really notorious outlaw group, Project Eclipse, uh, and they bombed the heck out of a one such group living on the planet and kind of wiped them out. So. You know, beware if you're an outlaw group thinking that you're going to be safe from the long arm of the Navy all the way out here. Um, it's also a problem not only from just like outlaws and violent types, but corporations looking to take advantage of all these resources have come in 
and to maximize their profits, they haven't been using the best environmental, uh, you know, plans. So they're starting to be a issue with like strip mining and other stuff that isn't so good for the world. And they've been getting in conflict with the settlers who just want to live in this beautiful planet. So it'll be interesting to see how all that plays out in the coming years. Now, the Lyris flotilla. Uh, flotilla is a term for a kind of a unique Banu style of station. Banus don't specifically build space stations. Normally, how it happens is at organic place like trade route crossroads where ships often congregate, like if traders are going there and trading stuff, a lot of ships would start arriving to service them. Like you'd have repair ships and refueling ships and restaurant ships. And as the trade route gets busier and busier, those ships hang out there longer and longer. Eventually, they'll start mooring them together. They build infrastructure between them uh, and build larger platforms and make it nicer until it grows over the course of time organically as this almost station-like collection of different buildings and ships. Um, and so that is how Lyris formed it. The exactly cause of it is a little point of question because it's not exactly along a natural trade route, but there's still a flotilla here. So the theories are that either it was the original terraforming station was the root of it, or if you look at the oldest buildings, perhaps it times out nicely with the evacuation of no-go. So maybe one theory is that it was the Banu fleeing from the planet's surface were the first ships to form this flotilla. Um, so now, basically, this has become the major trade hub. So all the resources collected in the various belts and planets on, on Gliese 3 come here. And it is a major point of trade. A lot of human corporations come here to find hard to find resources and metals. Um, and there's also like a, a big collection of other shops and gear and interesting food. Um, and like it's said that like there's a lot of like big market here for out of date human clothing, so off sales, cast off, out of style stuff, as well as like you know like saddle ball championship shirts for teams that didn't actually win the championship, end up here. And you can see you know Banu wearing like jumpers 29, 42 champions when they weren't. Um, also here a word of warning when you're doing trades. With Banu, it's very traditional to have a drink from these uh, tea things called slomadons, uh, which we might have an image for. We'll see if we can include that. Uh, and it's kind of like a communal teapot where they have these drinking straws attached. And it's traditional in Banu culture when you're doing a trade deal that you bring a little something to add in, an herb or a spice to add into the pot. So you all build it together and you all drink from it to show a sign of trust. Um, and humans who go to make deals there are warned to use caution and drink sparingly, even though it's rude to refuse altogether, because sometimes, depending on which herbs and spices in there, the drink can be quite potent. Um, so yeah, so that is Gleese in a nutshell. There's a lot of fun, exciting commerce happening here, a lot of commodity trading to be done. So I hope you get a chance to visit it in the wider verse someday. I know I can't wait to see it. Thank you so much for joining us here on Loremaker's Guide to the Galaxy, as well as for supporting all of Star Citizen. Uh, we couldn't be doing it without you. We say it a lot, and that's because it's true. See you next time. Bye. Thank you for watching. So if you want to keep up with the latest and greatest in Star Citizen and Squadron 42's development, please follow us on our social media channels. See you soon.